We trix cows a day's black wheat, said cows a week to Katoni, black wheat. A victorious cause was pleasing to the gods, but a defeated cause was pleasing to Cato. Cato the Younger, also known as Marcus Porcius Cato Eudicensis. Eudicensis was the name bestowed upon Cato after his death, which took place in the city of Utica, hence the name Eudicensis. So who is Cato? Cato is known for a lot of things. He is known for being a Stoic philosopher, for mimicking Cato the Elder, his great-grandfather, for being someone whose actions helped to bring down the Roman Republic, and what I think most people know, being Julius Caesar's arch-nemesis. All of these are true, more or less. Cato often gets forgotten, however, when it comes to the major players during the fall or end of the Roman Republic. But Cato was there through it all, and played a major role in it. Sullust, a contemporary historian who lived during this time period, claims Cato was Caesar's equal, although they were different. How can someone who was seen as a minor character be an equal to the mighty Caesar? What I'm going to explore is the life of Cato the Younger, who he is, and what role he played in bringing forth the end of the Republic, and the efforts he made to save the Republic. In order to talk about Cato, it is important to talk about his great-grandfather, Cato the Elder, also known as Cato the Censor. Cato, as a young child, will be enamored with tales of his great-grandfather and will style himself in his perceived image of Cato. Cato the Elder was born in 234 BC. He was the first of his family to achieve high office in the Roman Republic. He served during the Second Punic War, and his bravery during the war against Hannibal brought him distinction amongst Roman senators. Cato the Elder despised Greek culture. He thought it made Romans weak. You might wonder why he hated Greek culture. That is because Cato believed that farming was essential to the Roman state and that it produced the bravest and sturdiest men. And he believed that Greek culture diluted this. Cato was seen as something of an eccentric. He produced works that discussed the management of slaves and farmland and believed that a Roman should be content with only seven acres of land. He advised farmers to always be on alert and if a slave slacked off, with the reason the weather was bad, Cato would ask why was an indoor work done. If a slave was sick, Cato would ask why was he given full rations. If cattle or a slave was no longer able to work to their fullest, then Cato suggests to sell them. The annual cost of a slave, in Cato's eyes, was 78 denarii. To put it into perspective, free laborers would have an annual cost, if they were married, 250 denarii a year. When it came to politics, Cato criticized heavily Scipio Africanus. Scipio embraced Greek culture, and Cato disliked him for that. He also thought invading Africa was a bad idea, as it extended the war against Carthage. He also criticized Scipio's military discipline, suggesting that he was a bad commander. He was also active in the law courts, prosecuting anyone he deemed tainted by Hellenism. In 198 BC, he became praetor and ruled with strictness and austerity. Now you can catch a glimpse of who Cato the Elder was, a very strict traditionalist, conservative Roman, who championed what he believed were Roman values. There is one more thing I would like to say, which I find hilarious about Cato the Elder, is that in 184 BC, Cato ran for the office of censor. And censors, for those of you who don't know, handled the five-year Roman census. But they also acted as guardians of public morals and could even remove a senator from office for moral indecency. Well, when Cato became censor, he removed a senator from office for embracing his wife in public. I just imagine a senator hugging his wife and Cato shouting him down for it, expelling him from the Senate. So now that we have a brief understanding of who Cato the Elder was, I will now jump into Cato the Younger's early life and childhood. Cato the Younger was born in 95 BC, but by the time of his birth, his family had fallen from prominence. This is because many of his family members were killed, and by the time he was four years old, he was orphaned alongside his sister, Porcia. When his father died while a candidate for the praetorship before 91 BC, Cato and his sister remained with their mother, Livia. Livia took her children, young Cato and Porcia, to live with their maternal uncle, Marcus Livius Drusus. However, Livia died, and so Cato and Porcia went under the guardianship of Livius. Cato grew up alongside his half-brother Caipio and his two half-sisters, 
one being the famous Servilia, Caesar's future lover, and the mother of Brutus, Caesar's future assassin. Cato would become very close to these two, especially Caipio. When he was asked who he loved first, Cato replied Caipio, and when he was asked who he loved the second, third, fourth, and so on, he replied Caipio every time. Growing up, Cato learned about his family and the great Cato the Elder, and he would have become enamored with them. However, learning was difficult for Cato. Plutarch describes Cato as being dull and slow, but once he learned something, he retained the information, but learning for him was laborious. This would suggest that Cato was not that intelligent, and certainly some of his fellow Romans felt this way at times. But this isn't the case in my opinion. When Cato was around four years old, a high-ranking Italian official named Pompidius Silo came to the house of Marcus Livius Drusus, who was a tribune and proposed the enfranchisement of Rome's Italian allies. While there, Pompidius playfully asked the children if they would support their uncle's legislation. Caipio agreed with a smile, but Cato held his tongue, refusing to answer, and gave a menacing four-year-old glare upon Pompidius. Well, Pompidius picked up Cato and threatened to throw him out the window unless he pledged his support. He tried his best to scare Cato. According to Plutarch, Pompidius shook Cato a few times while holding him through the window, but Cato remained silent and Pompidius put him down and admired the boy's bravery. Two things about this story. One, it may not have happened. And two, if it did, this was surely meant to be playful, as I took it. Livius was much more powerful than Pompidius, so there could be no way that he would threaten the child of a tribune, especially one that is trying to help him. Livius will have been murdered in 91 BC for trying to get his legislation passed, and so Cato, along with his sister, will have went to Mamercus Aemilius Lepidus Livianus, brother to Livius Drusus, who was adopted into another family. It is uncertain whether Cato and Porcia moved in with Mamercus, but it is very unlikely that Cato and Porcia would have been abandoned, especially since apparently the dictator Sulla took interest into young Cato. And the fact that Mamercus was married to Sulla's daughter, Cornelia, would suggest that Mamercus took over the care of the young children. When Sulla became dictator and began his proscriptions, Cato was about 14 years old. When Cato saw the destruction that was occurring in Rome, Cato asked his tutor, Sarpedon, why no one slew Sulla. Sarpedon replied, saying that men feared him more than they hated him. Cato then said to give him a sword and he would do it himself. But when Sarpedon saw the seriousness in Cato's eyes, he restrained him from doing anything. And since then, he would keep an eye on Cato. As you can see here from these stories, Plutarch, as he's our main source on Cato, is showing that Cato from the get-go has a deep sense of morals, that he is unwavering in his convictions. And as I continue on, you will see how this unwavering conviction will make it very difficult for Cato to see other people's perspective and how this attitude will cost him. When Cato turned 16 and became an adult, he became a member of the priesthood in charge of sacred rituals. This was a big deal as it was rare for one so young to attain this position. It was most likely due to his relations with his uncle Mamercus and Sulla that he achieved this. This position was the first step of Cato into the world of Roman politics and made him known among Sulla's lieutenants. Shortly after, he gained his inheritance, which was 120 talents, which amounts to 2,880,000 sesterces, which would make him part of the equestrian order. He would buy a house and live an even more simple life than he did before, according to Plutarch. Now, even though 2.8 million sesterces makes Cato very wealthy, it doesn't make him wealthy in the eyes of some of the leading senators. Cato also began studying in the philosophy of Stoicism under Antipater the Tyrian, but he broadened his horizons by also studying Epicureanism under Philostratus and Peripatetic under Demetrius. He also studied and practiced in oratory, adopting a warlike oratorical approach, which was important for advancement in politics. All in all, Cato had a normal aristocratic education. It is around this time that you'll begin to see Cato adopting strange and archaic mannerisms that represents Rome's past of Cato the Elder and beyond. For instance, on journeys with his friends and others, he will walk instead of riding a horse, which would have made it awkward for his friends who had to look down to talk to him. In Rome, he began walking the streets in nothing but a toga, abandoning the tunic underneath and sandals. 
and even his toga was different, using much more purple than the crimson togas that was the standard, mimicking the statues throughout Rome of ancient men and the founding fathers. What you're seeing is Cato's attempt to appear in touch with Rome's ancient past, that he was not only conservative, but he embodied the very spirit of those ancestors. He did this deliberately because he believed the current practices of Rome were wrong and he wanted to change that. This is no doubt the influence of Cato the Elder. When the Basilica of Porcia, a public building that Cato the Elder had commissioned as censor, was proposed by tribunes to remove one of its columns as it blocked the view of the forum, Cato opposed this as was the natural thing to do. Here, his oratory skills paid off as he won the case and prevented its removal. Here he was in his early 20s, most likely close to 23. This was a great opportunity to introduce himself into public eyes. Cato decided to marry in his early 20s to his cousin Amelia Lepida, daughter of Mamercus, the man who raised Cato. I'm not sure as to why Cato would marry his cousin, as he was already related to Mamercus. Marriages were meant to form political alliances with Rome's leading families, you know, expanding her connection, but... It's possible that Cato loved the girl. She was originally engaged to a member of the Scipii family, Metellus Scipio, who broke off the wedding, but Metellus changed his mind and wanted Amelia. This shocked and infuriated Cato. Mamercus, who had the authority over Amelia, decided to give Amelia again to Metellus Scipio. Cato denounced this and mocked Metellus in poetic verses in the style of the Greek poet Archilochus. Cato was also going to bring Mamercus to court, but was persuaded by his friends not to. This shows again Cato's extreme nature. Mamercus raised Cato, and so to sue his uncle is not only ungrateful, but considering Mamercus is one of the most powerful men in Rome, Cato would have made an unnecessary enemy of a powerful man, and if not an enemy, it would have alienated him from a powerful family. Being forced to give up Aemilia, he instead married Attilia daughter or perhaps granddaughter of Attilius Serranus, who may have been the consul of 106 BC, who was murdered by Maris and Cinna in 87 BC. Attilia was from a diminished family, like Cato, but most likely was well-connected and wealthy. They would have two children together, a daughter named Porcia and a son with the same name, Marcus Porcius Cato. Cato would also marry off his older sister to Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, a man from such a family that Cicero described him as someone who was destined for the consulship from birth. The web of Cato's connections would grow further. His older half-sister Sevilia would marry Marcus Junius Brutus and have a son of the same name. Cato would have a strong influence over Sevilia's child, who was Caesar's future assassin. The younger Sevilia would marry Lucius Licinius Lucilius, the optimate commander who fought in the war against Mithridates, in 72 BC. Around 23, Cato's half-brother Caipio became military tribune and was serving under the consul Lucius Gellius Publicola, who was sent against Spartacus. Cato, who was devoted to Caipio, joined Publicola's army as a volunteer. Although Publicola's army was twice routed, Cato fought bravely and started to earn himself a reputation for his virtue and discipline. Publicola would be replaced with Crassus, who was eventually part of the first triumvirate, even though the war wasn't going well, Cato earned some military awards for his actions. When the consul Lucius Gellius offered him these military awards, Cato refused this, stating that he didn't earn them. To refuse an award from a consul, Rome's most powerful men, especially as a private citizen, was unorthodox. Military glory and bravery were one of Rome's most respected qualities. Cato was seen as strange and was probably looked down upon for this by those who were there and it must have been an embarrassment for the consul to have his evaluation questioned by a young man. It is possible that Cato didn't deserve the award, but what Cato here is showing is one, that his standards were much higher and possibly two, that he is mimicking that same strictness his great-grandfather Cato the Elder has shown. This behavior actually enhanced his reputation more than accepting the awards would have and many talked about him back in Rome. In 67, Cato would run for military tribune. During this time, a law had been passed, possibly the Lex Fabia, that limited the number of followers or attendants a candidate for office could accompany, and may have also prohibited the use of slaves for the sole purpose of remembering people's names. So when Cato ran for military tribune, everyone was ignoring this law. 
but Cato made a public demonstration by being the only one who followed the law. A few things here. One is that he gained the respect of those around him who thought it was a noble thing for him to follow the law, but it also annoyed the other candidates who found it difficult to imitate him. So if you look at it in broader terms, he's disrupting normal practices and further imitating the strictness of his great-grandfather, which, to other Romans, would further signify Cato's adherence to ancient traditions. Another thing is that this law may have never actually been a law, but that it was merely a proposal that had never been ratified. If this is true, then it would have annoyed the other candidates even further as well as show, on full display, Cato's strangeness by following a mere proposal. He will ultimately abandon this later on as he probably realized just how hard it was to remember everyone's name. Cato will win and become military tribune. He will be sent to Macedonia to serve under proprietor Marcus Rubius. Here Cato will further display his strict virtue by living amongst his men, sharing in their duties, and also treating them kindly. He still was walking everywhere instead of riding a horse, which is even more different as tribunes were always on horseback from just a strategic standpoint to a customary one. All in all, his behavior made Cato appear old-fashioned, which enhanced his reputation. Cato took a two-month furlough in 67-66 and traveled to Pergamon to seek out the Stoic philosopher Athenodorus, who was very much like Cato in terms of inflexibility. Here they would form a friendship, and Athenodorus would end up living in Cato's home in Rome until his death. But here is something critical into Cato's psyche. A law had once been passed in 167 BC forbidding philosophers from living in Rome. But by the time of Cato, it was commonplace for wealthy aristocrats to house philosophers. So Cato here is not following the strictness of his great-grandfather who hated Hellenism and Greek philosophy or that of ancient tradition, but is also doing something that is contemporary. You will see Cato's willingness at times to bend this fervent display of virtue associated with ancient tradition. When he was back in Macedonia, word reached him that Caipio, his half-brother, had become very sick at Inus in Thrace. Caipio was on his way to take command under Lucilius or Pompey in the war against Mithridates. Once Cato got word of this, he immediately left and set sail during a storm. When he arrived, Caipio was already dead. Plutarch describes Cato as being overcome with emotion, more so than what was normal for one following Stoic philosophy, which part of it was to live without passion. Cato lamented and clung to Caipio's corpse. He spent lavishly on his funeral and ordered a polished marble monument to be set up in Inus, and apparently, as he was the heir to Caipio's inheritance, he spent everything from his own pocket rather than his brother's. When Cato's military tribune came to an end, he traveled east, which was common for young Roman aristocrats. Here he would travel the land and meet different people. He will also spend some time with the king of Galatia, Deotarus, who was friends with Cato's father. But he did not travel as a typical Roman aristocrat, which was to show a display of their wealth and status, but Cato instead traveled as if he was a man of low birth so much so that people took him as such and didn't offer him the typical hospitality as they would an aristocrat. Each time Cato was treated as a man of low birth, he would chastise and humiliate the local magistrates for their failure in treating him correctly, and he would threaten them that he could take what they didn't offer. This would happen again at Antioch. When Cato reached Ephesus, he encountered the great Pompey at the height of his reputation. Cato disliked Pompey and had a genuine reason for it. Pompey killed two of Cato's in-laws, he was still his henchman, and killed many nobles, including Marcus Junius Brutus, the first husband of his half-sister Sevilia. He used populist tactics to get what he wanted, which Cato disliked even more. And his treatment of Lucellus, who was the former commander of the war against Mithridates, was another one. But Cato would end up visiting Pompey, and Pompey would be eager to greet him. Pompey would praise Cato in public, praising his virtue, but Plutarch says that this was just for show and Pompey couldn't wait to see Cato leave. Why did Cato see Pompey even though he disliked the man? I have read that it might be because Pompey was proconsul, and I believe this to be the case because as you will see with Cato, that even in the face of defeat, he will still end up doing what he thought to be traditional and lawful by showing respect to the political office one held. For example, 
He will defer command of an army to a man who is higher ranked than him, even though that man wanted him to be the leader and was actually a terrible leader. But because he was a higher ranked, Cato wouldn't break the law. So I think Cato here is just doing what he thinks a Roman aristocrat should do. When he visited Diotarus, king of Galatia, he again acted strangely. For when Diotarus sent Cato gifts, a custom perfectly common and acceptable, Cato abruptly refused and actually left the city. This left Diotarus confused. He thought he may have offended Cato by sending subpar gifts, and so quickly sent what he thought were better, higher quality gifts, but Cato still refused. Diotarus begged Cato to at least give them to his retainers, but Cato again refused. It's strange as to why Cato would refuse these gifts and hurt a family friend. However, like his rejection of military awards, this seemed to enhance his reputation rather than hurt it. Cato would now return to Rome from his eastern adventures in 65 with Caipio's ashes and begin his journey and entry into politics. In 64, Cato was now eligible for the quaestorship. Cato took the time and dedication to learn the office first before running. He read all the laws pertaining to the office, learned all the details, and questioned previous quaestors. Cato wanted to know exactly the scope of his power, and he won the position with ease on December 5th, 64. Now there is a reason Cato worked so diligently to understand the role of quaestor as this is the only time he put so much effort into learning an office. And this is because Cato probably didn't understand the role of quaestor. And this is understandable, because quaestors had many different roles. For instance, a quaestor in Rome's city port, Ostia, would manage the granaries. A quaestor in Rome would manage the state treasury. They could also be a financial officer in a consul's army. This is only part of its complexity. The laws that regulated it were much more complex and not easily understood, and quaestors before Cato would just pass it off to the professional clerks who worked in the treasury. You have to understand that there was so much money coming in from so many different accounts that it was tedious to keep track of it, and most of the Roman aristocrats who ran for the office weren't doing it to manage the treasury, but again, to gain prestige and reputation. But this caused widespread corruption, because not only were these clerks being corrupt with the treasury, the treasury was also used to store senatorial decrees, which the clerks would either forge, fake decrees, or edit existing ones. As soon as Cato entered office, he got to work. He took control over the clerks who didn't give up their power quietly. He did this by prosecuting the worst of them for corruption. He collected all debts to the treasury and paid out all debts owed by it. He reformed how the senatorial decrees were handled, reducing corruption in the future. By doing all of this, Cato became immensely popular amongst the people. Cato also prosecuted those who had been awarded the 12,000 drachmas by Sulla for killing those on his prescriptions. Sulla, when he became dictator, had made a long list with thousands of people's names on it. Those whose names were on it were killed and their property and wealth confiscated. This was used against political enemies, but also those who were wealthy and those who Sulla just didn't like. Cato recovered the money with the help of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was prosecuting these men for their role in Sulla's murders. While it is unclear how Cato got those to repay the money they had received from Sulla, but it was most likely from Julius Caesar successfully prosecuting these men, forcing them to repay the money. While Cato was quaestor and was prosecuting the corrupt clerks, there was one that was brought to trial and was defended by Lutatius Catullus, who was a powerful Roman optimate and sitting censor. The clerk's guilt was obvious, but Catullus pressed his case and made a speech. His speech didn't go well, and Catullus opted to beg the jurors as a favor to him to acquit the clerk. While he begged, Cato interrupted him and prevented him from speaking further and even threatened Catullus, who was way more powerful than Cato, that he would have him hauled out of court if he continued. Cato said to him, It would be disgraceful for you, Catullus, who are censor and sit in judgment of our lives, to be thrown out by our attendants. Then Cato and Catullus locked eyes, and after a few moments, Catullus was the first to blink, and so he stormed off, confused and perplexed. Perplexed because he was superior to Cato, and his influence failed him both personally and politically. He was confused because Cato was aligned with Catullus. They were both conservative optimates, but Cato repelled him unnecessarily. 
Plutarch would describe this moment as severe and presumptuous. Catalyst would not give up. When the vote came to condemn the clerk, there was one more vote for condemnation than acquittal. However, the last voter wasn't there on account of illness, but Catalyst had him carried to the voting spot to cast his vote. But Cato refused him, saying that the vote is late and doesn't count, and so the clerk was found guilty. Again, you can see here that this isn't normal. Cato should have been eager to make connections with a leading senator, but instead he enforced the law. On the last day of his quaestorship, while Cato was being escorted home by a bunch of citizens praising his good work, he received word that his friend from childhood, Marcellus, possibly the same Marcellus who was consul in 51 and worked with Cato in trying to bring down Julius Caesar, was about to falsify some documents on the state treasury at the request of his friends. And this was normal behavior, but Cato wasn't about to let his hard work be tainted by this corruption and so he stormed back and erased the false documents and made Marcellus leave. Even after his quaestorship had ended, Cato had every document copied and made his slaves copy new transactions that took place. He no doubt didn't trust any of the quaestors after him to combat corruption. During Cato's time as quaestor, he had begun helping Lucellus, the former commander of the armies against Mithridates, achieve his triumph, which Pompey was not about to let happen because Pompey wanted full credit for the war. Cato was only helping Lucellus because he married Servilia, Cato's half-sister. Cato, with his energetic style, confronted and verbally attacked Pompey's agents, trying to get them to withdraw their attempts at thwarting Lucellus' triumph. We don't know much about how Cato managed to obstruct Pompey's friends, but it must have been that Cato was able to gather senatorial support to make defense possible. And this is foreshadowing Cato's ability to gather senatorial support against people or bills that he didn't like. However, it wasn't until Cicero backed Lucellus that Lucellus was able to earn his triumph in 63. That is it for now. If you've enjoyed part 1 of the life of Cato, feel free to like, subscribe, and share the video. It helps out a lot. And with that, I'll see you soon. Wale.